It's been 25 years since methamphetamine use exploded in New Zealand. But despite the drug's well-known dangers, tens of thousands of Kiwis are still hooked. Wastewater drug testing has revealed methamphetamine use has risen by a third. Close to a third of middle-aged New Zealanders have tried methamphetamine at least once. The number of users is big, and the busts even bigger. Police today revealed details of the biggest meth seizure ever at New Zealand's border. Here's the staggering statistic. This year, police confiscating 428 kilograms of meth, and that's just for the first three months, January, February and March. So how and when did we start to spiral? And why isn't the fight against drugs working? Kia ora, I'm Wilhelmina Shrimpton, and today on The Detail, we take a look at New Zealand's problem with meth, also known as P, or in Australia as ice or crystal meth. One news political reporter, Benedict Collins, made it his mission to find out how we got so hooked, writing a new book that looks at Aotearoa's history with the drug. Mad on Meth explores our cultural and political experience with it, a boom he tells me began in the late 90s and stemmed from normalised amphetamine use back in the 50s and 60s. Everyone was, a a lot of people, especially amphetamines. Um, You could get them at your chemist for a while. You didn't even need a prescription. Um, Methamphetamine was regularly prescribed to um, people for weight loss. Particularly women were were normally being um, prescribed methamphetamine. And yeah, some some of the um, tales, like I looked back through the the old newspaper records and stuff like that. And um, when it came to amphetamines especially, it was like, Athletes all the time were taking them before their events. One year, the Waikato uh, Cycling Association complained to their national body, saying, hey, look, just about every athlete at the recent national champs at uh, Karapiro were, were taking these, what have become known as PEP pills, these um, amphetamine and meth pills. Yeah, and it was just really widespread. We had shearers going, trying to shear the most sheep in like eight hours, and they were popping amphetamines. Even newspapers sometimes would be like, oh, yeah, this pianist is trying to break the record for the longest time playing the piano. He's been popping a uh, couple of uh, <laughs> amphetamine tablets and smoking cigarettes as he does it. Like, it wasn't really a big deal. People just did it. There was even a um, a National Party MP who stood up in the, in, the, in the house in the 60s and was like, hey, let's, you know, let's keep in mind, you know, amphetamines can be absolutely brilliant, you know, when they're used in the, um, in the correct circumstances. So, yeah, kind of uh, interesting to see a National Party um, MP speaking out in favour of amphetamines in the 60s. It's quite a crazy concept to think about the origin of a lot of these addictive substances. It's yeah. like nicotine, cigarettes, alcohol, a lot of it at the beginning is it's all fine and we're promoting it. And I remember, I think it was camel cigarettes back in the day. Doctors recommend (laughs) smoking camel, which in this day and age... Nine out of ten doctors prefer to smoke camel. Exactly, which in this day and age is is just absolutely wild. And then the horse bolts and then people get addicted and then we realise retrospectively that actually it's really, really terrible. Yeah. Um, How how did we even get here in terms of um, the boom in meth usage? Yeah, so my book, Mad on Meth, kind of looks at the evolution of meth. So you had it legal and then it got banned in the... In the early 70s, they started restricting it, knowing that it was causing cases of addiction. Then we had the Misuse of Drugs Act come in um, mid-70s. Then in the late 90s, that was really when people figured out, hey, I can go to the chemist, I can get cold and flu medication, I can take that home, I can extract the pseudoephedrine. And that's a key precursor chemical, right, for, for making methamphetamine. Add some other chemicals together, you can cook it up into crystal meth. Um, so then we had that real problem with with people cooking meth and and meth labs, almost out of nowhere, it kind of re-emerged in the late 90s. And in the mid-90s, like, cops would bust, like, one meth lab a year. By the early mid-2000s, it was, like, 200 meth labs a year they were busting. Um, Then John Key in 2009, he came in and banned pseudoephedrine, effectively banned pseudoephedrine, made it much harder for people to get. And it did have quite a big impact, right? It stopped all those ram raids on the chemists for people and robberies of chemists of people trying to get pseudoephedrine. But what happened is because what we, when we banned pseudoephedrine, we were basically following the lead of other countries around the world who were also banning pseudoephedrine to try and crack down on domestic meth labs. And then what we really saw is countries like Myanmar, countries like Mexico basically create these super labs where they're now churning out tonnes of methamphetamine and they are flooding the world with methamphetamine. So there's, you know, it seems every few months now we get a new record bust, you know, that just three quarters of a tonne, that was unheard of, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We're just getting these huge shipments of methamphetamine coming in. 713 kilos of meth came from Canada hidden in maple syrup. 
The police are describing a $70 million methamphetamine operation as highly elaborate. Customs found nearly 200 kilos of meth concealed in wheat threshers imported from Dubai. Nine people have been arrested, including three senior gang members. Headlines like these seem to be a regular occurrence. They're massive crackdowns and busts associated with the criminal world. The perceived dirtiest of the drugs, meth has been mostly linked to local gangs and in turn theft, assaults and even murder. But Detective Superintendent Greg Williams, the head of our National Organised Crime Unit, told me it's not that simple. He says the market has evolved from one driven by demand to one driven by supply. And the way it's run has evolved too. It was a number of really influential uh, senior gang members coming from the gangs like the Rebels, Comancheros um, and the like that, that were pushed back here to New Zealand. And what they brought with them was those transnational links and sophistication that was quite different to the way in which the gangs here operated. Because of the sophistication now, we tended to move away to calling them criminal business entities. I think it's a better term because it shows you the sophistication uh, of how these enterprises operate and function. And just like any business, you know, it's, it's resource infrastructure, it's multiple forms of revenue, it's building a market, and it's having professional facilitators supporting them and enabling them to operate. So what sort of started as a, a, a domestic-focused issue with, with meth, you know, what, you, what we've seen with, you know, pea cooks and meth labs, yeah. has developed and evolved into a complex international operation that's connecting these gangs to these overseas syndicates. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And you can land 600 kilos here, for something like a couple of million dollars and produce $123 million in profit. So the profits are immense, but what the gangs have understood in the criminal business entities is that methamphetamine allows them to actually control communities on those communities that they're addicting, and they get it. So what they're doing is handing a lot of this uh, meth out for free in communities, very vulnerable communities right across the country, and then once they've got those people hooked, then those people are doing what they want because they're trapped by addictiveness and we're talking an incredibly addictive drug and they're trapped by indebtedness. And this is where we're seeing you know, people being used to sell drugs on behalf of the gangs and mainly methamphetamine, so it's sort of a revolving circle, buying guns for them, you know, prostituting themselves. Um, it's just tragic. And, and I'm talking here from experience of going into some of these very vulnerable communities and, and seeing this happen. In this one situation, you know, they got this kid to come to parties. They were a good performer at school, good good sports person. And they convinced this person uh, to come to parties and next minute they're giving her meth for free. And then within a few months, she's she's hooked. Um, they knock on her door and go, right, now you've got to pay. So now you've got to go service five guys in this town today because you've got to pay your debt. And she tried to commit uh, suicide. They, the town, they pulled her out of that town and got her into rehab and then got her into another profession. You know, and that's just chilling, isn't it? Wow. Just think, and that's just one kid, you know, and, and, and understanding when you talk to the local officials, they're telling you they don't control the town anymore, the gang does. Mm. And that is the, that's the thing that drives us um, to think about how are we going to, um, how are we going to systemically respond to this threat uh, for our country and protect our people. Hearing about the potential profit that can be made is is huge and therefore, despite being a small market, we're clearly a really attractive one for these overseas syndicates, for, for the gangs. How does it mostly get through our borders? Daily, uh, our, our customs teams in Auckland are seizing and identifying meth coming in the mail system. Um, only in the last couple of weeks we've had couriers arriving one had the biggest seizure ever. I think we've seen 27 kilos of meth in a suitcase. Another one a couple of days ago with a couple of kilos. So we have couriers bringing it in. We see it being brought in and shipped in through container networks. So ships bringing containers in or hiding it underneath a boat is another common way in which they uh, they try and get it in. Uh, air freight uh, is another way. So flying it in amongst air freight. Uh, small boat. So we've had attempts and we've seen methamphetamine come into the country, being brought into the country by small boats. Those are sort of the major ways uh, that we're kind of seeing. Of course, we've 
We also get ephedrine and pseudoephedrine being imported because we still have a manufacture of meth occurring in the country uh, right now. Uh, I think the key thing here is saying we're absolutely getting flooded here. But, you know, uh, the reality for us is, uh, you know, for New Zealand Police, NZ Customs, our partner agencies, is this this entire situation occurring rapidly since 2014, 2015, even in the last three or four years, has required us to make quite a significant sort of sea change, I guess, ourselves in the terms of the way we're going to respond to this impact. And we really, as I said to you, if you think about it being a criminal business entity, then we've got to have a systemic way in which we're going to respond as well. So you know, attacking the resource infrastructure, under- understanding and attacking the revenue, taking their assets. So I think we're at something like well over $500 million of assets seized over the last five years. If we can reduce the market and the addiction, if we can prevent kids coming through for not using methamphetamine, then that means less money for gangs, less power and control. So that's a big focus for us. You know, I say to everybody, we're on a knife edge here really because the mass of production across the world means those transnational crime groups and others are absolutely intent on dumping more and more uh, our way. Um, so that's um, that's why it requires a sort of international approach. And this has been the big change too for us is we've built incredibly uh, robust, trusting uh, relationships across the world by installing our police liaison and customs liaison officers and others in, in key countries across the world now and also joining forces with key agencies like Australian Federal Police, ACIC, the Australian States, uh, the DEA, FBI, National Crime Authority, and in multiple other countries to share information and intelligence. And we have an incredibly good picture and understanding across our part of the world about what the supply lines look like and who's involved. I mean, it really does feel a bit like a game of drug whack-a-mole because I feel like the the supply and resources that these cartels have is infinite. So it's part of their profit model. They lose some and then they just sub some in the same place. How do you how do you even stay on top of that? You know, it's it's obviously a great success when you have these busts, but then another one comes through and then there's more and more and more. Well, like I, like I said to you, you know, um, even when I took this role on a few years ago, we said, look, if we just literally just focused on lock-up drug dealers, we would never run out of work, right? So we, we had to change our thinking and apply the systemic approach. We have a vision in our TNOC strategy, our transnational organised crime strategy, to make New Zealand the hardest place in the world for organised crime to do business. So this is very much our focus on the way in which we're operating and functioning. So we are currently you know, looking at our systems across the country, at, at, our, at our maritime and our borders, to, to shore them up, at our mail systems, our international partners, our private sector partners, O's industry working at the border uh, to make them more resilient. You know, it's a long game, but we are we are well and truly focused in this. Is this issue under control, and is this issue one of the things keeping police and customs the busiest? I believe that uh, our understanding and knowledge of what's taking place sees us in a good position to be able to make significant impacts on those transnational crime groups wanting to come here and import. Do we get it all? No, we don't. Um, But we have a very good sense and a good process here of identifying those people at the top echelon here and holding them accountable uh, for their offending, and we will continue to do that. But while more meth appears to be landing on our shores, Benedict Collins says the number of users has actually remained pretty steady over the past 10 years. And according to the New Zealand Health Survey, just 1-2% to 2% of Kiwis will take an amphetamine-like substance. But about 15% of people who do use meth are going to end up you know, getting addicted to it, having a lot of problems. And the Drug Foundation, they estimate there's about six to 8,000 really heavy methamphetamine users in New Zealand that they use the majority of, of, of methamphetamine here. And those are the ones that are going to end up you know, with the big problems not only with methamphetamine itself as a substance, but being drawn into that black market. In terms of, you know, you hear about the worst case scenarios as well, so there are situations like that. You know, you, you get shown pictures at, at high school of people with sores on their face and missing teeth, and that is the, the worst case scenario. What about people who are experiencing harm, who are, I guess, um, you know, high-functioning addicts? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I spoke to a, um, a, a teacher who's used for like 160 days in a row who's going to school every day, you know. But but also I think you need to be careful when we talk about, you know, teeth falling out and sores and all that stuff because that's happened 
with different drugs in the past as well. Mm. And it's often blamed on the drug. And, you know, there are huge scare campaigns um, like the Montana meth um, program up and over over in the United States that, you know, they, they're just doing tens of thousands of ads trying to scare people about the sores and your teeth falling out and stuff like that. And there's, there's this counter argument, right, that there's the drug Adderall, which is a um, ADHD drug very, very widely prescribed in the United States that does almost exactly the same thing. Um, it's a slightly different chemical, but it pretty much has the same effect on your brain as methamphetamine. And there are never any stories about people with you know, sores or bad teeth. And the argument is that it's not so much the drug that leads to this, but it's perhaps you're not looking after yourself as well. You're not brushing your teeth anymore. And that's why you might have dental hygiene problems rather than it being so much meth itself. So there's no snapshot or cookie cutter of what an addict looks like. And I think that's probably a really important thing I mean, to note. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I mean, it wasn't that, well, it was 20 years ago, but, you know, um, a nightly newsreader on the um, TV3 News, right, was smoking methamphetamine before he read the news. And he used to say, you know, that the words would jump off the teleprompter and dance around the room and he'd have to concentrate really hard to get them back onto the auto cue so that he, he could read the news. So ab- absolutely, there are people everywhere using methamphetamine. Mm. I feel as though it is the seen as the dirty drug where there are other drugs that are uh, Sexier, uh, if you know what I mean. It's um, the party drugs. They seem to be more socially acceptable in this day and age, whereas there's this kind of this dark cloud over methamphetamine. How bad is it? Because there are people who would try it in their daily lives and they don't get addicted. Yeah. Well, it's interesting it's, you say that, right? Because I, I talked to uh, Blair McDonald, who is New Zealand's top drug cop. He's left the police man. now. And he was saying MDMA is a lot more socially acceptable as, you know, to, at a party to, you know, rack up a line of MDMA and say, hey, you want a line of this? Well, it was a lot of people probably be a lot more put off by... If someone you know, whipped uh, out a bag of meth, yeah, you'd yeah, be like, like hey, whoa! Do you, do you want to smoke you know, meth, right? Yeah. And it, has, it does have a real stigma attached to it. And... In the book, I kind of look at the media reporting around methamphetamine. They kind of invoke like this Old Testament kind of reporting around methamphetamine. You know, it's regularly described as a demon, you know, as evil. Then I look back and a lot of drugs, a lot of different drugs have been like marijuana used to be described like that in the media mm. and, 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 and LSD and cocaine. And now it's methamphetamine. And, it's, and, and it really is kind of whipped up a, a real stigma around that. And the problem when you do that with a drug when it is so stigmatised, it makes it a lot harder for people to seek help. And even even the Drug Foundation now, they you know they do their pill testing and stuff, and people who rock in to get a pill tested will be like, oh, hey, tell me about this stuff. And now they're starting to test meth as well. And they're saying people who come in with meth are a lot less, you know, they're a lot more stigmatised. They're not as willing to talk because um, they'll, they'll check it for traces of fentanyl and stuff like that. Um, but they just don't have the same conversations because the people are a lot more stigmatised. And talking about that that kind of change in mindset around drug usage, you know, we've seen things like the needle exchange being introduced, um, yep. the pill testing or drug testing at festivals, and know your stuff guys do amazing work. But, yeah, see, seeing that evolve, do you think there's also a need for a rethink on the way that we approach drugs? Because people are going to use drugs no matter what. Uh-huh, yep. So how do we do it in a way that makes sure that they are safe? Yeah, so you look up into Northland, right? They've got the project up there, Te Ara Oranga, and it's it's kind of like the police and the health guys have got up together up there and have basically brought in kind of de facto decriminalisation. So if they catch a user, let's let's say, for example, they bust a, a supplier's phone and they'll realise who their, their customers are, they'll, they'll go around and say, they'll knock on the door and they'll say, hey, mate, not here to arrest you, but you, we know you're... You know, you're using meth. Would you like to go and see a health official, um, or a, you know, a counsellor, or, t- or talk to someone in the health area? And it's proving incredibly successful. It's having really great rates of of people saying, oh, yeah, "I do have a bit of a problem. That's great. I'll go and have a chat." And people actually getting off methamphetamine. And it, it's interesting, right? Because the the New Zealand government has been repeatedly advised by different officials. The Law Commission, like nearly 15 years ago, advised the government to bring in the decriminalisation of drugs. And I think. A a lot of people, including a lot of very senior politicians, don't really understand the difference between legalising a substance and decriminalising a substance. If we went and decriminalise drugs, what you might do, like they're doing in Australia, in parts of Australia at the moment, say for example you got caught with a little a bit of methamphetamine, they might say, hey look, we're going to take your methamphetamine off you, here's a hundred dollar fine, but we'll waive that fine if you go and talk to a counsellor or a health expert about what's going on. And... What it does is it means a lot of people don't end up with criminal convictions that affect their entire lives, but it also kind of it points them in the direction of, of getting assistance and, and getting help. Another initiative that has been suggested would be kind of 
trying to get those six to 8,000 really heavy users, trying to get them away from the black market and get them off methamphetamine and point them towards help. And that would be Helen Clark and the Drug Foundation kind of teamed up and did a bit of a report, kind of like a government supply, where they might come in and give people who are heavily addicted, give them access to government-supplied methamphetamine or, or amphetamines in, in a bid to try and get them out of the black market, get them interacting with health services if, if, if they wanted to. And overseas with multiple different drugs, it's been shown when, when governments do this, when they step in and, and they get the black market out of there, you know, it, it straight away it reduces the need for these people to be committing crime, to afford their drugs, get some away from the black market, get some away from the violence and the, you know, everything else that comes with that. And gradually over time, the use starts declining because they don't need to go out hunting to try and find meth every day because they can just mm. go and they can just go and get it in the morning, get their meth for the day, and and it's done, right? You don't need to spend all day seeking meth and, and seeking trying to get money to do it. Would New Zealand be ready for something like that? Because we had the cannabis referendum. We almost got over the line. But, uh-huh. I mean, it, cannabis is probably seen as the, um, the softer substance, I guess, and the fact that we weren't even able to get past that. Absolutely. I feel yeah. like we're quite a far way off, despite all of the benefits of a program like that. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to assess whether or not the program did deliver benefits. On the flip side, right, you look at the needle exchange, just incredible results that that saved New Zealand hundreds of lives, millions upon millions of dollars in in health treatments by giving people, by intravenous drug users, access to endless supply of clean needles. I mean, it's been incredibly efficient. You look at um, pill testing, and, and I guess what they're proposing here is not making it legal, it would be a very, very targeted supply to those very heavy, highly addicted people to methamphetamine, trying to help them and, and break that cycle of addiction. Do you think we would ever be able to go a step further, and this is something that I've talked about um, before with with other drugs like MDMA or cocaine, going one step th- further and going legalisation, regulation, when you think about the potential contribution to GDP and ma- making sure that people know what's in the substance? Do you think that that would ever be... Uh, something that well, could be explored. Well, I mean, you're right. We're very conservative here in New Zealand, right? Mm. When, it, when you look at the cannabis referendum narrowly losing, I mean, we're so conservative. You know, Jacinda Ardern refused to say which way she was going to vote mm. in that referendum, unlike every other referendum. And you look even to the United States, which brought us the war on drugs, right? Nearly half of all these states now have legalised cannabis. All around the world, it's like this real trend towards legalising you know, a drug that we continue to criminalise here. That's it for today. I'm Wilhelmina Shrimpton. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. This episode was engineered by Rangi Powick and produced by Alexia Russell and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to Benedict Collins and Greg Williams. Matewa.